Okay, so it's a little after 11 in the morning here on the West Coast. We'll go ahead and get this thing started. My name is Vince, and I just want to welcome all of you to the Best of the Best webinar series brought to you by NoVeg, the design software superstore. I want to thank all of you for joining us today. We're very excited not only to present Grasshopper for Rhino, but to have Andy Payne going over it with us. Um, just a little background on Andy. He's a licensed architect and founder of Lyft Architects. He's currently pursuing his doctoral degree at Harvard's Graduate School of Design. His work explores embedded computation and parametric design and is a co-author of the Grasshopper Primer, which provides an in-depth look at Grasshopper plugin for Rhino. Andy's going to speak for about the next 40 minutes or so, so during that time I will be on listen-only mode, but please feel free to send any of your questions through into the question box. After each section, that Andy goes over, we'll have a brief Q&A before moving on to the next section. Um, just a heads up to everyone, we will be recording this webinar and information on how to get it and where to get it will be made available towards the end of it. So I think having said all that, Andy, are you there? Yep, I'm here. Um, I think I'll go ahead and switch it over to you so we can get started. Okay. And yep, there you go. Uh, thanks, Vince and Frank, for inviting me to come talk, and thanks, everyone, for listening in today. Um, as you said, we're going to try to walk through a few different tutorials, um, and I will try to I will document those up and, and share those with everyone so that if we move a little bit fast today, um, you'll be able to go back through the webinar video and the source files and sort of walk through the examples that we go through today. Um, so as I said, uh, our, the, this is an introduction to Grasshopper, and so really probably we should start with sort of what exactly is Grasshopper. Um, at its core, uh, it's sort of a node-based or visual programming language, um, which allows you to make sort of logical relationships between uh, one or several different parameters, uh, which defines sort of what's called a parametric space. Um, and we can use that parametric space to comprise dozens or even thousands of related but distinct forms. Um, all that's a pretty convoluted definition. Um, and it's probably easier for me to just show you exactly how it works uh, as opposed to trying to explain it uh, necessarily verbally. So to start uh, in the Rhino command prompt, we just start by typing in the word grasshopper and up pops the grasshopper editor. Um, and as you can see, it sort of automatically takes up a fair amount of screen real estate. Um, that's a little bit unfortunate, but of course we can always minimize, and, and the toolbar at the top is unique in that if you double click on it, it will just hide it to a single bar um, so that you can quickly kind of look beyond uh, into the, the Rhino viewports um, and then switch back to the Grasshopper editor. Um, I should note that uh, Grasshopper, um, if we create a new document, um, Grasshopper has a its own file type. So if we hit File Save or Save As, it's a called a Grasshopper XML file or a GHX file, and that's different from say Rhino's file type. Which if we go over to Rhino and hit Save As, it's a by default a uh, 3DM file, and so um, it has its own standalone file types, which make it a little bit unique um, and and a little bit different. So you need to know that you have to save sort of both files if you're using Rhino geometry or a Grasshopper definition. Um, Okay, so the first thing we sort of notice, and I'll try to highlight this, is uh, let me see if I can use the go to webinar pins, is this area right here, which is the um, Grasshopper uh, editor, um, our canvas. And that area is where we actually use all the different components and create this sort of logical graph um, that I was talking about in the relationships. Um, up here at the top, let me see if I can, up here at the top, um, we see a, a ribbon panel. This is called the component panels, and they're separated out by different tabs. Um, and this is nice because it separates things into different categories. So, for instance, if you were to go and create a circle, um, you would probably go under the curve tab. Um, if you're making a surface, you'll probably go under surface. But for a circle, you'll go under curve, and they have all these different subcategories. And you'll notice that there, there's by default a series of uh, icons representing different components that you can use but if you want to see a full list you have to click on this black bar and that will drop down a series of uh, all the different components that are under that subcategory 
So in this case, if we wanted to just create a circle, and you see this first one down is a black circle and a yellow square, and it says create a circle defined by a base plane and radius, we can just left click and drop anywhere on the canvas, and uh, it will drop a circle component onto the, ca onto the ca canvas. You'll also notice simultaneously that in the top viewport, if we scroll in, that there's now a circle drawn at the base plane, and that's because the circle, for this particular type of circle, there's lots of different ways to define a circle in Grasshopper, but for this one, it's asking us for a, um, a base plane of a circle and a radius. So if we hover over these inputs, um, there's an input side and an output side. If we hover over the inputs, we get a tooltip that, that tells us what it's looking for. And in this case, it's using the world XY. It has a couple of default values. It's using the world origin on the XY plane, and then a radius of 1. So we can override that radius by connecting a slider. So under the params tab, um, and again, this is just sort of going over the basics of the interface, and I'll, we'll walk through more of this as we go on today. But under the params tab, under special, we find a whole lot of different components that will be useful for us. But the first one that we'll use a lot is this one called a number slider. Um, so if we drag and drop a number slider onto the canvas, um, you can see uh, it's it, we add it out here, and by default it goes from 0 to 1. So if we, if we just left click, hold down our left mouse button over the grip, this has got a, a little grip um, of the slider, and it will automatically try to lock into one of these inputs. So in this case, if I want to define the radius of our circle, um, I can just, once it locks into that R input, I can just release, and now you can see that circle changing um, based on this slider value. And so what's happened is it over, it's overriding that value of 1 that was being used before, and now is being supplied by a number slider. We can change the units of that slider by double-clicking on the handle area. Um, if you double-click here, it will simply just ask you to type it in. If you double-click on the handle, it will ask you to set a, a whole number of different things, and you can set, change it to integers if we want to just step in whole numbers. If we want to step in even numbers, we can do that, or odd numbers. Um, or we can use floating point, which just means it has a decimal value, and you can define how precise you want that to be. Um, and then, of course, you can set the minimum and maximum. So if we want to set our minimum to be 0 and our maximum to, say, 10, um, we can just click these little uh, check boxes. So now we click OK, and now our slider will go from 0 to 10. So that's how you can basically customize your slider interface. Um, if we wanted to disconnect uh, an input, we could simply right-click on any input and right-click and say disconnect all, or we can say disconnect, and if we had more than one, it would let us pick uh, which ones we wanted to actually disconnect from there. The other way you can disconnect is if we hold control down. You notice that my icon changes from uh, a normal uh, color icon to this red colored icon. And it doesn't matter which way I, I connect it. I can go left to right or right to left. Um, and, and that will disconnect that slider value from, from the component. So now it goes back to using its default value. OK. So that's the component panel. And if at any time today you get lost at where I actually find these components, um, I'll try to do a good job at showing you where these things are. Um, but at the same time, if you get lost, there's a nice little tool that you can double-click anywhere on the canvas and enter in a keyword search. So if we just start typing in circle, um, you see that there's a couple different types of circles, but the one we're using is this one, so you can look for the icon. Um, and so you can also add things to the canvas that way. So that's a nice little feature. Um, the last thing I wanted to cover, because I want to move rather quickly through some of this stuff so that we can move into some of the tutorials, is there's a... Uh, a canvas toolbar right here. It's right underneath the component toolbar. Um, and there's a lot of different uh, little buttons that you can check out um, on your own. But some of the ones that I wanted to show uh, for us today are, um, are at least the first ones are these two right here. It's a, a picture of a, a head of a man and one's blindfolded and one is, isn't. And that just says enable preview or disable preview. And um, what those mean, basically, is that a lot of times with Grasshopper, you generate some sort of geometry in order to get to another step in the process. So, for example, let's say we were trying to find the midpoint between two other points. 
well, we could solve that mathematically if we wanted. Um, but the probably the easiest thing to do is just create a line between those two points and then evaluate that line at the midpoint. Um, we're only interested in the actual midpoint. We don't really care about the line. So you still need that line to be processed, but you don't necessarily need to see it in the viewport. So what we can actually do is we can right click on any component and tell it to turn the preview off. Um, and you can see when I do that, my circle disappears from the top viewport. It's still being calculated in the solution, so if I hover over the output, we see that it still says circle with a radius of 2.856 meters. Um, but that just doesn't show up in the viewport, which is nice. We can certainly right click and just turn the preview back on. Um, and the reason why I highlight these two buttons is if we had multiple ones and you wanted to turn them off, so I just copied and paste Control-C and Control-V. If I wanted to select both of those circle components and turn the preview off, I could use this icon up at the top. So that's a nice little feature. And of course you can turn them back on. Um, the other thing I wanted to, to mention uh, before we move on is that uh, Grasshopper by default, uh, you'll notice that if you try to select that circle in the viewport, um, you won't be able to. Um, and the reason why is that that's just a preview of the geometry. It's not actually making a circle every time you change the slider value. It's making a preview of that circle. And the reason it does that is that's how it's, it remains so fast. You probably noticed, or hopefully as you start to work with Grasshopper, that's incredibly fast. Um, but the reason that's doing it is because it's just making a preview of this certain geometry. So if you want to actually have that geometry uh, embedded in the Rhino file, what we have to do is something called baking. We have to bake that geometry into the canvas. And you'll notice that when I select this component, it turns green, and the geometry in the viewport also turns green. So in order to bake uh, an object into the scene, um, we can either do it at the component level by right-clicking and choosing bake right there in the submenu, um, or we can hit this fried egg up here on the canvas toolbar, and that says bake selected objects. So if I select that object, um, and I'm going to move the go to meeting uh, panel for just a second. Um, if I select that object and hit bake, it's going to bake that geometry onto whatever my default layer is, or whatever layer I have selected. In this case, it's the default layer. So if I select this and hit bake, um, you'll now see that there's a curve in my Rhino viewport that I can select. Um, I can move it over as well, and so that's now uh, an instance and that's on my, if I look at the object, it's now on my default layer. So that's um, one nice way to actually take grasshopper geometry and put it back into the Rhino viewport so that now you can use it. Now it is interesting to note that that is now frozen geometry. It's no longer linked to our grasshopper definition. So it's no longer going to change as I change these parameters. Um, but it is a way to actually then take that geometry and you can output that towards, you know, uh, Illustrator or AutoCAD or whatever other, uh, or just use it for Rhino geometry, um, whatever you want to use. Those are sort of the basics of the interface. There's a lot more that I could cover, but then um, we wouldn't actually get to walk through many of the tutorials. So what I wanted to do is um, just go back and open it up to any questions uh, or answers to see if there are any questions uh, so that I could, uh, while we're talking about the interface, I could try to answer some of those. So. Um, Vince, are there any questions that have popped up? Um, yeah, the only one that came up is uh, your the sound on your mic is fading in and out, so I guess if you could hold it at a constant distance, maybe, to make it a little clearer. Okay, I'll tell you what, I think I might be able to... Is it louder now? It's actually, I'm using a headset, so it should be at a, a distance. Um, yeah. Or maybe I can turn it up. as the other option. Um, yeah. Okay, well that's good to know. Um, yeah, sounds good I'll now. I'll try to, try to mm -hmm. do better. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, okay. one quick question here. If there are ten sure. objects and we need to, and we need them in ten different layers, what could we do? Uh, that's a good question. Um, you can actually, so um, one thing I didn't show was that if you, if you use the fried egg component, it's going to uh, dump it onto whatever layer you have selected. However, if you right-click and choose bake, um, you should have the ability to provide a, few, a little bit more control over how it actually gets baked. Um, so, for instance, I could actually choose which layer I want this particular geometry to bake onto. Um, 
I could also tell it, you know, uh, do I want it to be in wireframe or shaded if I have surfaces, um, and set a few other parameters. So that would be one way. Of course, if you're just if you only have ten, um, it wouldn't take you too long to just, you know, select a component, bake it to a layer, select a different component, select a different layer, and bake it onto that layer. Um, I could see the point um, that it could be a frustration if you have a, a, a whole number, like a much larger number of, of thing, layers that you have to bake onto. And there are a number of third-party plugins um, that uh, have tried to address sort of the baking aspect of Grasshopper. So there are some that allow you to actually bake with color, because by default, unless you're baking a mesh, um, it doesn't really allow you to bake objects with a certain color. So there are a number of uh, other third-party plugins that you that are generally free. Um, and that's something that you might look into on the forum. So um, uh, I forgot to mention this, but I should have mentioned this at the beginning. Um, if you haven't already been to this website, this is the Grasshopper uh, forum. Um, and so you can actually go there, and there's a, a really great place to actually post questions. Um, and there's a lot of uh, great resources as well as these third-party plugins that would enable you to sort of bake with uh, more attributes than you have with just sort of the default settings. Did that answer the question? Yeah, that's great. And then we'll just get to one more so we can get on to the tutorials. Um, sure. How customizable is the interface, like colors, fonts, et cetera? Um, well, it's pretty, it's it's actually really custom. I'm, so there's a new feature. I guess it depends on what the user was asking in terms of color of the geometry or color of the viewport um, or color, like what type of colors do they mean? Um, I don't know. They didn't specify. Okay. I guess the well, viewport. So a couple of different things. Um, if you're trying to change the color of certain geometry, um, there's a little button up here on the Canvas toolbar that says document preview settings. Um, and what we can do here is, as we, as I was saying, is when we select it, it turns green, and you saw that circle also turn green. So we can set different colors. You can see it's slightly transparent. Um, but let's say we wanted it to be orange when we select it and have it be totally uh, trans, uh, opaque, um, and then we wanted it to be hot pink if we select it. So we can click OK, and so now that circle, I don't know if you guys can see that, on, um, if that color was a bad choice. Um, but now it's orange, and when I select it, it turns hot pink. Um, can you guys see that at all, or is that the color? Uh, so that's a one quick way, and that sets it globally um, for the for the entire document. You can also, of course, set custom preview uh, colors. So if we wanted to, um, let's see, we, there's a component in here that says custom preview, and what that asks for is what's the geometry and what's the shader. So in this case, I can assign this this. Uh, Um, and tell it to be whatever color I want. So in this case, I'm just assigning, you know, whatever color I want to assign to it. Um, if I want it to be black, I can do that. And so with a custom preview, and then of course, um, all of the other panels, like this thing is called a post-it panel. It's this yellow icon here. It's a panel, and it allows you to set notes to yourself, or they're actually very flexible. But the nice thing about these is, yes, you can set the font color or font type. If you want to set it to sans serif or something like that, you can also set the color of the font and the color of the actual panel um, can change as well. So there is a great deal of customization um, that you can get into. And of course, if you start to group objects, that's one thing I didn't mention too. But if we wanted, let's say this was a component that was a nice group of objects, we can select all of that and hit Control G, and that will create a group around those objects. And of course, with that, we can also set you know, color codings and stuff like that. So you can start to um, color code your definition based, and I, I would highly recommend that um, because you can actually start to provide a hierarchy of your definition and, and start to inform your set, not only yourself but other users, potential users, um, about what it is you're trying to do in a certain definition. Does that help? Yeah, I think that's great. Um, if you want to go ahead and get started with the tutorials. Uh, okay. Sure. Okay. So I'll just get rid of some of this. This was just sort of an introduction. Um, so today what I thought we'd do is try to cover two different tutorials. Um, the first one, what I wanted to do was cover a, a simple trust system. I didn't really know what the audience was going to be like or, and what their background was. So um, what I try to do is throw together just two simple examples. And this one, um, 
uh, is a trust that will be able to set the length, the height, and the number of nodes that define this trust. So the way we'll start this, I'll try to walk it through diagrammatically and then we'll sort of go through it in Grasshopper. But the way we'll start this is we'll, we'll create two points in Rhino and then create a line between them. Um, and then we'll take that line and move it up, make a copy of it and move it up uh, some distance along the z-axis. Um, then we'll subdivide both of those chords um, and remove every other chord, uh, every other point on both of those chords. So the ones we'll keep are the black ones here. And then what we'll do is weave those together, um, weave those lists of data together to create the interior truss chords. So this will be sort of the first example. And the nice thing about this is we'll do it with one truss, and then we'll be able to use that same gra grasshopper definition to create any number of trusses that we want. Uh, so to start, uh, what we need to do is we need to create two points in Rhino. Um, and so in the top viewport, uh, we can use just uh, the point command. You can type in point or you can use this icon here. But this will just tell us to drop a point somewhere in the Rhino viewport. And it doesn't really matter where. I, I'm dropping it in on the top viewport so that they're all planar. Um, and that would be a good idea uh, if you wanted to do the same. But I just created two points in Rhino. So this is Rhino geometry, not grasshopper geometry just yet. And so the way we bring in Rhino geometry into Grasshopper, so, so the nice thing about Grasshopper is that it can work fluently between Rhino and sort of the Grasshopper geometry. It can go back and forth. Um, and so um, what we do, there's a, uh, a number of different data types um, that Grasshopper can work with. And there's two different, uh, those are all found under the params tab. And so under the params tab, uh, we find uh, data types that are, are called primitive data types. These would be numbers and integers and booleans. Boolean is just a true false value. Um, and then there's a number of other ones that are specific to geometry. So points and vectors and curves and things like that um, all fall under the geometry data type. And so you can think of these uh, as sort of uh, container objects. Uh, if I drag out the under params geometry point, um, this represents a collection of points. It doesn't actually create any points. It's just holding, a, it's a container object for a collection of points. Um, and so if we right click on this point component, or, or parameter, and say set one point, uh, you notice that my grasshopper screen disappears and it takes me into Rhino and it says uh, pick a point object to reference. And it's asking me for a type of point. Uh, you can change that to coordinate if you want. But in this case, I want to set it to point because I want to reference one of these point objects. So I can just select that point. And now you can see um, that my uh, screen, uh, that my point has, uh, uh, the grasshopper has showed back up. And that my point now has a orange X. Yours should be red. The reason why mine is orange is because I still have these settings. Um, so what I'm going to do actually is uh, try to go back to the default values um, and there, uh, as, so that they'll be the same as yours. Um, and so we have this point, and you can see that if I move my Rhino object, if I move that point around in, in space, that that point updates. Uh, and the reason being is that Grasshopper updates the solution on two different types of events. One is on any type of Grasshopper event. So as I change that slider to that circle, um, it recalculated the, the, that circle, and so it remade that circle. It also updates um, when we change anything in Rhino. So if I change this point around, it recalculates where that point should be. Um, so we now have one point reference in. What I need to do is copy and paste, so Control-C and Control-V, and I'm going to set right-click on that point parameter and say set one point and set the other point. So now you could, should see that... Uh, if I select one, it turns green. Uh, if I select the other, it turns green. And so we have two red X's um, in the top viewport that are uh, referencing in that point geometry. And if we hover over, it says reference point. So what we need to do next is to create a line between them. So we're going to go to the Curve tab in Primitive. And there's one under here that just says Line. It says create a line between two points. So we'll drop that onto the canvas. And so we're just going to create a line between points A and B. And so now you can see that we have a, a line connected. Again, this is all being driven by where those points are in Rhino. So if you start to move those points around, the line obviously changes. Okay. So now that we have our line, we'll consider this as our 
our, the base cord of our truss. Um, so I'll s scroll in over here in the perspective viewport. Um, and so what I'm going to do now is to take that bottom line and move it up some distance in the z-axis. Um, so I'm going to use a move command to actually move that, that line up some value in the z-axis. So we got to, for all sort of move and rotation and those types of um, uh, operations, we're going to go to the transform tab um, and go to Euclidean. And there under Euclidean, you see we have a couple different options. We have mirror, move. We can rotate, which we'll be using later in the afternoon. But in this case, uh, there's one that says move. So we'll just click that out. And this is asking us for what's the geometry that you want to move and what's the translation vector that you want to move it. Um, so in this case, the line is what we want to move. And then what we, uh, how we want to move it is along the z-axis. So we need to find a vector in the z-axis that defines how much we want to move that. So if we go to vector, and then there's a subcategory called vector, under here you'll see something called unit z. And that basically is saying uh, provide a unit value of 1 times the z in the z-axis. So by default, we have a, a, a unit of 1 in the z-axis. That's what this vector is telling us. Um, if we provide it an input, it will multiply that unit vector times whatever input. So if we set a slider to 2, we'll multiply 2 times that unit vector, so we'll get a z-axis of 2, a vector of 2. So let's do that. Let's go to params special number slider. So params special number slider. And let's just drag out a number slider onto the canvas. And why don't we just double click on the slider handle. Um, and we'll leave this as floating point, so the R value right here. Um, and then let's set the max value to, say, 10. Again, this is whatever units you're, you're using. Um, by default, Grasshopper is a little bit unitless um, until you actually start working with, uh, say, distances like lines or some, things like that. Um, it's just a number, but in this case, I'm working in meters. So we have 10, maximum 10 meters, which is a fairly high number, but it depends on how far apart these points are. I'll leave it to you to kind of customize your own screen. Um, so we've set a max range of 10, so we can click OK. Um, and we can just define that, uh, connect that slider to the F input of that vector. So now instead of 1, we have a vector of 0 0.25. Um, this is just so we can change this z vector on the fly by just this, using the slider. So if I connect the z vector to the t input, um, you can see that I have a, a, my line will move up and down on the z axis as I move this slider. So it looks like for this type of truss, about 2.4 or 2.5 is about what I want it to be in this case. Um, again, it, yours will, yours may vary. Um, so now we have a line, we have the bottom line, um, and I'm going to change the uh, color again, sorry, uh, since I changed that the first time, everything looks a little bit odd, um, so that when I select it, you can actually see it. Um, let me know, uh, Vince, if uh, anyone is having trouble with the actual screen resolution or the color. Um, so. I have a line uh, on the bottom cord, and then this move component is what's defining the top cord. Um, and so now what we want to do is subdivide both of those curves, those lines, um, by some number of values so that we can remove every other one and then weave them together. So to do that, we're going to go to curve division, and there's a, a component under here that says divide curve. Um, and so what this does, divide curve, there's a number of different ways you can divide a curve. There's divide curve, you can divide by distance or divide by length. Um, under the divide curve, basically what it tries to do is take a curve and subdivide it um, so that there are even number of segments in between here. So in this case, the n is set to 10, so there's 10 equal line segments now um, on that line. And what that does is it creates 10 even line segments, but it creates um, 11 points. Uh, so it's going to give us, because it keeps the first and the end point, so it keeps all those points. So it gives us the P output or the points along that curve, the division points. It also gives us a tangent vector um, and then the T parameter along that line uh, where those points occur. Um, what we're really only interested in are the points though. Um, so we've divided that, uh, su that bottom line and then what we're going to do is copy and paste that same component um, and then let's divide the top line. Okay. So now we have points on the top and bottom uh, that have been evenly subdivided. 
But what if we wanted to actually make that parametric so it wasn't just hard coded so that n equals 10 every time that we could actually can we can control that um, with a slider. So why don't we do all we have to do is provide a slider for both the n inputs of both of these components. So let's go to params special number slider. And again, we'll now um, because we can only subdivide something in even uh, in a uh, finite number of segments, so one, two, or three, a, a whole number integer. Um, what we're going to do is double click on this, and instead of setting it to integer, because we know that we're going to be removing every other point on this line, um, what we actually need it to do is set this to be even numbers. So in this case, I want to set the rounding type to be even uh, right here. And then we can set the max number to however high you want. I'll set mine to 14, um, but it's up to you. These will ultimately be the number of nodes, uh, twice the number of nodes that we'll be using. Um, so in this case, I'll just set it to 14 and click OK. Um, and you can see now as I step, I'm only stepping in even numbers and not whole number integers. So if I connect that to the in input of both of those uh, divide components, it's important that we connect it to both that they have the same number because we don't want to have uh, a different number of points on the bottom line than we have on the top. Um, okay, so now we have points. Um, I'm just going to use a post it panel to visualize this. The, now we have a series of points on the bottom line and on the top line that are, are literally just points in space, so three coordinate values in space. And what we need to do is remove a certain number of uh, uh, points because what we're going to try to do is connect from this point up here and then down here and here. So we're going to try to weave them together. So we need to actually eliminate some of the points from our list. So to do that, what we're going to do is go under sets, sequence, um, and there's a component under here called cull pattern. And cull just means remove. So we're going to remove uh, elements from a list based on a Boolean pattern. And again, Boolean patterns are trues and false. So I'm going to connect the P output to the L input of this. Um, and then what I have to do is define a Boolean pattern um, of what I want to do to remove or, or keep. So if I right click on the P input, I can say manage Boolean collection. And for this first one, what I want it to be is true, false. And what that means is it's going to go down the list. And if it's true, it will try to keep it. So this one, we're working on the bottom line right now. It will keep that point and then remove it if it's false. So it keeps the first one, removes the second one, and then it repeats the pattern over and over. So then it keeps this one and removes that one, so on and so forth. So if we keep, say true, false, um, you can see now that if I select it or if I turn the divide component upstream from this off, that it now kept this first one but removed the second one, kept the third one, and then removed the fourth one, so on and so forth till it got to the end. So I'm going to now copy and paste that call component, and I'm going to use it for the list on the other, uh, on the up, upside uh, line. Um, only this time, what we want to do is shift it one, right? We don't want uh, to keep the first one and remove the second one. We want to keep the second one and remove the ones on either side of it. So I'm going to right click on the P input and go back and manage the Boolean collection. And instead of being true false, uh, I want it to be false true. I'm just inverting the the um, pattern. So in this case, and I can turn the divide component off now. I can turn the preview off on that. So in this case, now I have points that are offset from one another. And you can see that they're, they're staggered so that if I draw a line between them, they should form the inner side of the truss. Um, so right now, though, they're not one complete list of points. So if, what we need to do is create a polyline. We need to provide a list of points that we can uh, draw through. So we need to weave these two lists together. So the w way we're going to do that is go to sets, lists, and there's a component called weave. And so what this is going to do is going to try to literally, uh, it's going to take whatever pattern we provide it, and by default it's going 0, 1. So it's going to take the first item from the list that we provide in 0, and put that first, and then take the first item from one, and then first item from zero, and first item from one, and kind of weave them back together. So if I provide the call pattern into zero, and this call pattern into one, my resultant list, I can turn the preview off now on these two call pattern components. The resultant list, now you see when I select the weave component, it's, it's combined both lists together. Um, 
and they're now also ordered. So it now put this one first, and then this one second, and this one third, and this one fourth, and so on and so forth. So now my points are ordered. So if I go to curve, spline, polyline, I can connect the W output, which are the points, and the V input of the polyline are the vertex points. So in this case, now you can see I'm creating one single polyline that is woven through all of those different points. And you're probably asking, that looks a little bit like a truss, but at the same time, we have these little extensions at the top. So how do we deal with those? Well, you'll remember that these points on the top from the coal pattern, um, we're defining just the points along this line, but they don't extend beyond it. So if we were to create another polyline, so we go to curve, spline, polyline, and just feed it those points, um, and then we can turn the original move component over here, which is defining that line up here, off, you can see now that we have a line just being drawn through those trust points. Um, so now we can, this is still being driven by whatever parameters we set. So again, if I start to move my point around in space, you can see your trust change. And of course, you can also change the height if you want uh, to adjust that on the fly. And you can change the number of nodes uh, along your truss. Now, before we close on this, the reason why I like this example is we've just now made one complete truss based on two points, right? The, these two points are our original inputs that define this truss. So there are a number of ways we can actually define those two points, though. Instead of being just one point here and one point here, we could feed it a list of points here and a list of points here. So what I'm going to do is go back over into Rhino and create a NURBS curve. Um, again, it doesn't really matter what yours looks like. Um, and I'll just sort of draw any kind of shape over here. And remember, if we want to reference some geometry in from Rhino, you know, we want to go under params and go to geometry and go, in this case, I don't want to reference in a point, I want to reference in a curve. So I'm going to drop in two curve parameters. And I'm going to right click on this curve parameter and say set one curve and choose one of them. And then I'll right click on the other one and choose the other curve. So now that we've, now we've referenced in those two curves. Um, and just like we divided a curve over here, we can divide these curves the same way. So if I go to go back over to the curve tab and go to division and divide curve, I can divide this curve by 10. Um, and then I'll, I'll use another divide curve to divide this other set, this other line. So now, just like before, we've actually created uh, a series of segments along those curves. And so what I can do is feed the P, the points, output of those, to either of these point parameters. And so now instead of, um, instead of being using those single points from Rhino, it's being overridden by these uh, points that are from the divide uh, points component. And so now you can see I'm actually creating a whole list of trusses, a whole number of trusses that are spanning between each of those two edge curves. Uh, so very quickly you can make a series of uh, structural elements that are spanning whatever type of geometry you want. And again, this is all uh, based on the Rhino geometry, so if you start to play with your curves, you can adjust this stuff on the fly. So are there any questions um, on that tutorial? Yeah, I hope we just get to a couple quick ones so we can get on the last uh, tutorial. Yep. Why is the line not moved but copied with the move command? Okay, good question. Um, that's always a, a confusing one right at the beginning. Um, the reason is that this line component is still doing its job, right? Its job was to create, and I'll just, let me just connect this so we go back to our original um, truss over here. This line component um, here, let me turn the preview off on these. Um, this line component, its job was to create a line between those two points. This move component, its job was to move that same line up. So you can think of move kind of like a copy. There is no copy component in, um, in Grasshopper. The reason being, so right now, this one's still doing its job, which was to create that line, and then downstream from that, we move it. So it's, this job was to actually move it up in space. And so a lot of times, you can actually create copies of objects 
using a sort of transformation. So in this case, like moving or rotating or mirroring um, also create duplicates because the original is still there and then whatever you transform it, it will be a, a duplicate object. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's good. Um, so how would we move without copying? How would you, well, I mean, so, um, like I said, there is no copy, so if you want to copy, you would do some sort of transformation um, in general, but if you don't want to see that original line, you can just turn it off, right? So, um, if you want to just move it and then uh, to a new location and not see where it came from, you can just turn the original geometry off, and now you just see the, the moved part of it, so it's no longer copied, it's just moved. Does that make sense? I mean, it's, it's yeah, still yeah, a copy, it's just you're not seeing the visualization of it. Yeah, okay. And then is it possible to record these operations and assign them to a button to build like a personal toolbar? Um, that's a good question. Actually, uh, there is a, so I think what you're asking is, um, you can't make like, uh, okay, there's a couple different ways. You can actually say create um, uh, a user object was, was one thing, but it seems like uh, that's been, I think you can only set that for a single object. What you could probably do is there's a new feature called, a relatively new feature, and the reason why I haven't like talked much about it is it's, I think, still under development. But there's a thing called cluster. Um, it's this component right here that says create cluster from selection. Um, and the way you have to do that is uh, you have to provide what are, uh, basically what this is going to do is compile, take all of those components and compile it into just one single little type of component. So if we clusterize this, um, it will literally try to create a small object um, just like that. So it, it compiled everything down. Now what happened was it doesn't now have any inputs or outputs, so it doesn't know um, what we wanted to do. So under the params special, there's a cluster input and a cluster output. So if we wanted to find, let's say, these points um, as our... Um, as Um, so we can drag that there. So now we have our cluster inputs, and ultimately what we want to have out of it is are these uh, these two polylines and that original line. So we can define our outputs um, like this. So we can define this. Um, I think we can hold, if you hold shift down, you can add multiple items into a single input. So you see, just like before, where I said if you hold control down, it turns red. If I hold shift down, it turns green. So now I've added multiple objects into that um, output. So if I select this and hold um, and then hit cluster right here, you can now see um, it's asking for us what are the points and then it will output the different line types. Um, it, clearly this is a little bit buggy because you can see right now the cluster object is being drawn back over to here. So there's still, the reason why I didn't bring that up yet because, was because there's still sort of a work in progress. Um, and so um, what I'd like to try to do is, I, I believe clusters would answer your question once they're a little bit more flushed out. Um, eventually that will be a little bit like an XREF in AutoCAD or something like that if you're familiar with those. So that you can start to create clusters of objects and then copy them around and uh, it will drastically increase the performance of your, of your canvas. But as I said, that's a little bit of a new feature so they're still working some issues out with that. Does that answer that question? Yeah, I think that's great. Um, if you want to just jump to the uh, last tutorial you want to do, I mean, we're running a little short on time. Sorry for the questions we couldn't get to. Um, okay, so the, for the next example, um, what we're going to do is we're going to create a point grid um, of objects, and then we're going to use the image sampler. Uh, what the image sampler does is it allows us to basically overlay a grid of points and then um, imagine as if the image was a piece of paper and we're going to overlay a, a grid of points onto the top of that image and then we're going to basically look under at each point and determine in this case what the brightness value is so if it's black it will be complete zero if it's white it will be one and anything in between will be zero or one so like a light gray will be 0 0.76 uh, so we're going to take those values and then use that to rotate a series of lines which will create strips uh, or sort of louvers. You can imagine this sort of as a skylight. But essentially we'll use that to create a movable louver system based on an image. So I'm going to go up here and go to File, New Document. 
And the first thing we need to do, and I'm also going to hit File New in Rhino, um, so that we're just uh, working um, with a new document. So the first thing I need to do is go to Vector, um, and I'm going to actually close this. Um, so the next thing we need to do is actually go over to Vector Grids. There's a whole number of different ways we can make point grids. Um, there's a lot of different ways um, other than these as well. But in this case, what I want to do is use what's called a square point grid. And by default, it gives us a, a set of cellular outlines, these square rectangular or square outlines. Um, it's also giving us the points at the intersections or at the corners of each of those cells. So, but it's just not showing showing up. It's just showing the cell outline and not the points. So if we want to actually see what those points look like, we can just dump those into a point parameter. So if we go to parameters, geometry, point, and dump those into the, a point parameter, you'll see that now we can see the intersection points um, right here and not the cell outlines. And if you want, you can actually just turn the preview off on that square grid because really all we're looking for are the points um, in this example. So right now, this is being defined as a, it gives us a, a base plane, in this case the XY plane is fine. Um, it's also asking for us the size of grid and we're just step one unit every time, that's fine with us. Um, and then it's also how many cells in the X and Y do you want to provide. So in this case, what I'm going to do is create a slider um, and we, we know we have to set a number of cells, we can't do a half of a cell, so we're going to double click on this and set the rounding type to integers. And then we'll set the max unit to say 40. Um, and I'll just click OK, and then I'll just set the current value to 40. So you want the current value to be 40, and then I'm just going to connect that to the X and the Y. This is the number of cells in the X and the Y. So now we have um, basically the number of points going in the X direction is 40, and the number of points going in the Y direction is 40. So we're going from 0 to 40 in the X and the Y. Um, so hopefully that makes sense, uh, because our spacing is one unit, and we just copied that, and we've added the 40 cells in each direction. Um, so we know our point grid is going from 0 to 40 in both sides. Next thing we need to do is go over, um, and I'm going to go to the source files folder, and I'm going to drop in um, the, nice, the nice way to actually add an, an image sample is we can just drag in any image we want, and by default, it will automatically instantiate a new image sampler object. If you don't want to do it that way, you can also go under Param Special and go to, uh, let's see, image sampler. Um, well, let's see, let's double click image sampler right there. Um, it's this icon right here, this uh, green pixelated icon. Um, the nice thing is by dragging in is if it's not square, if it's a different proportion, it will actually try to auto create the auto proportions for this. Um, so this image right now it actually ha is, has a domain. Um, and so what it's actually doing um, is it's being mapped between 0 and 1 by default. Um, so if I type in picture frame uh, and add this in uh, and then click over here, our image right now is basically being mapped to, to that size on, in Rhino uh, from 0 to 1. So if we right click on this image sampler, we, we have a number of different ways to set it. By default, it's saying to tile. So that would actually mean that um, if our points actually extend beyond this, it would look like uh, this. It would basically be tiling all of those images along the X and the Y until it reaches the end of the points. Um, we can also tell it to clamp, which would mean it wouldn't tile beyond that. Uh, and we can also tell it to flip if we wanted to. Um, but instead of this, uh, we don't want to sample for this. Uh, what we want to do is actually scale this image so that um, it's actually something like this, so that all the points that we overlay get uh, somewhere on the image itself. And so what we need to do is instead of having the domain of our uh, image be from 0 to 1, we need our domain to go from 0 to 40, or whatever the size of our point grid is. And we know that that's going from 0 to 40 because we set that up here. So the way we do that is if we double click on this image, you can see that by default we're going from 0 to 1 in both the X and the Y. But in this case, what I want to do is set the X uh, domain from 0 to 40 and the Y domain to 0 to 40, and you'll see that that now has changed uh, the, the domain of our image. Uh, 
Um, the other thing to note is that the channel right here uh, asks you how do you want to sample the image. By default, uh, it's set to RGBA colors, which gives us the red, green, blue, and alpha channel values of the image. In this case, we're using a black and white image, so we can just evaluate for brightness. And like I said, that will give us just a single value between 0 and 1. And that's this one down at the end that says color brightness, the black and white circle. Um, so if we click OK, okay um, now what we need to do, and so I'll get rid of this picture frame. Now what we need to do is actually provide it a, um, a series of points. You see it has an input grip, and so what that's asking for is, what are the points that you want to go sample this image? And so now that we scaled it proportionally, now all these points will be sort of somewhat overlaid on this image um, conceptually, and you'll be able to now analyze each of those points uh, for the pixel value for brightness. So if I add a post-it panel over here to the output, you'll see that it gives us a whole, uh, it gives us all of our points and has now assigned a value between zero and one, which is associated to whatever black or white uh, uh, color value we were getting from uh, that image. So what we're going to do is take these bl black and white color values, these 0 to 1 values, and assign that as a rotation value for a number of lines. So the first thing we need to do though is create a number of lines. So under curve primitive, instead of using this line which we just used, which was to create a line between two points, we're going to use something called a line SDL, which stands for start, point, a tangent, and a length. Um, so what we're going to do is the, the start point will be our grid of points. Uh, the direction we want to go is in the x direction. Um, so I'm going to go to vector and go back to the vector subcategory and go to unit x. So now we're going to draw lines in only the x direction. And by default, uh, the length is already set to 1, which is nice because our spacing was set to 1. So now our lines right now are being drawn from this point to the, to the next point, and, and then the next line is going from this point to the next point. Um, so we have a very nice uh, consistency with our lines. Um, and so now that we have our lines, what we're going to do is take those lines and rotate them about a certain uh, angle. So we're going to go back over to Transform and go to Euclidean and go to Rotate. So we're going to rotate our lines, these lines that we just made. Um, now we need to define um, a, a plane about which we want to rotate. So by default, it thinks we wanted to uh, rotate along the XY plane. You see there's a, a sort of gray plane area on the XY that's set at the world axis, and that's because that's what it's using as the default. So if we all did that, each line would be rotated about that point. Um, but instead of that point, we want to rotate each individual line about a plane right at its point. So this point would get rotated about that point, this line would get rotated about that point, and so on and so forth. We also want to rotate them not in the XY plane, but in the XZ plane. So to do that, we need to set a, a new vector, or uh, go under the Vector tab and create a new plane. And that's under plane or so Vector, Plane, and you'll see there's one that says XZ plane. Um, so it says XZ plane, so you can see now when I drop that on, there's an XZ plane. So you can imagine this is like a sheet of paper that that line is sort of rotating on. Um, and so what I need to do now is instead of just having one, I need to assign a single plane for each one of those points. So the O input is the origin of the plane, so if I feed it the list of points, you can see now we have a whole bunch of planes um, that we can use. So I will use that as the P input, and then because that obviously makes my viewport pretty messy. I'm going to turn the preview off on that. Um, and then lastly, what we need to do is use, we need to find an angle. And by default, Grasshopper uses angles and radians to rotate. And so what we're going to do here, um, it's nice that uh, our values are going between 0 and 1 because uh, a value of 1 radian is approximately 57 degrees. Um, and then a value of 2 radians would be 114 degrees. So um, if you want, you, we could just uh, take this value directly into the A input and be done with it, but that would mean that our angle would only be able to, we'd only be able to rotate our louvers up to about 57 degrees. Um, if you want to multiply that by some scale factor, so if we multiplied it by 2, then we could actually ampl amplify that amount of rotation. So what we're going to do is perform a little math. So we go to the math tab and go to operators and go to multiplication. And what we're going to do is multiply all these values, so that goes into A, and then we just have to provide a slider value, which is what we're going to multiply it by. So I'm going to just create a number slider, 
um, over here, so param special number slider, and I'm just going to double click on that. And in this case, I want the maximum to go up to two and not one, because we want to maybe go up to a total of two radians. Um, and so if I click that over, uh, connect that slider over there, now I'm basically multiplying all those values by whatever the scale factor is. So now we're getting some that are above one. Um, so now all I can do, now all I need to do is connect the R output from this multiply, and you can see that I'm getting these uh, lines rotating um, about each one of those uh, points. And so if you want, you can turn the line preview off so that you just see the, the rotated lines. Um, so now, we ha now that we have our lines, all we need to do is, is loft between them. And because we've been keeping everything in sort of a data tree, which we haven't talked about yet, but because everything's in a data tree, um, it will automatically loft everything in a single strip and then stop and then start again uh, on the next one. So if we go to surface uh, freeform loft, um, we can now loft between the geometry or those curves. So you can see that basically it's trying to loft in this direction along each of those curves. Um, and then once it gets to the end, it stops and creates a new strip starting here. Um, so in this case, and so now what I want to do is select pretty much everything upstream of the loft component and turn the preview off so that we just see the loft component. Um, so now you can see as I kind of uh, scroll through in my definition or sort of move around, um, you can kind of see that image show up from the image sampler right here. So where it's black, it's actually being flat, and where it's white, it's actually opening up to allow light to come through. Um, and the nice thing is that now that we set this up to a slider, we can actually animate this thing. So if we take, take this down to zero, they all become flat, right, because we're multiplying those values by a value of zero. But if you want to start to open those louvers up slowly, you can easily just multi, uh, scroll the slider, and you can start to see these value, these louvers begin to rotate by a, a greater value. Um, and so if you want, the nice thing about uh, Grasshopper is that any slider can be animated. So in this case, if I right click on the slider and say animate, um, it asks me what's the viewport that you want to uh, take a screenshot of, it's asked me for what's the resolution, what's the frame count, things like that, and where you want to save it to, and um, up here, and that will essentially create one frame. Um, it will sample this entire slider range um, uh, over a value of however many frames you want and spit it out into a series of images so that you could actually compile that into an animation if you would prefer. Um, so I know we're a little bit uh, running behind, but I wanted to kind of open it up into uh, some questions um, if there were any from this, this tutorial. Yeah, we'll just get to a couple of quick ones. Um... Could I use Grasshopper to get the effect of an associative dimension? Um, sure. Uh, so if we wanted to, well, these lines are all staying the same, but let's say we wanted to, uh, there is no dimension. Unfortunately, there is, I guess what, there's a little bit of a different uh, question. Um, if we had two, we had a point, and then we wanted to create a line between those two points, um, we could certainly... Um, so we now have a line between there. We can go to a analysis and we can find the length of that line. Um, and so now we, that's telling us that that's 14 point, you know, if I spit that out into a um, poster panel, that's telling us that that line is 14.304 units long. Um, and so you can kind of make your own uh, uh, dimensions. You could certainly then put a text tag. You could locate this, this dimension right at the middle if you wanted to make your own dimensions. But uh, there is no sort of standard dimension tool like there is in Rhino uh, if you go under dimension and say linear dimension. That, that doesn't exist, but you can certainly uh, get the same type of information, such as like what is the length of each line. So if this, this uh, you know, some sort of grasshopper geometry that we've been uh, working with, we can certainly analyze it. And so you can see the definition is, or the length of that line is changing as I move this point around. Um, so you can certainly then output that to any type of Excel spreadsheet or any other type of data that you want if you were to then try to, you know, use that for any t uh, drawing or fabrication output. Does that help? Yeah. Um, can we wrap a grid onto an existing surface? Um, 
Yes, uh, you can. It's called projection. I don't know that I'll have enough time to actually go through it, but you can actually. Yes, you can um, take any grid that you want. So basically, the way a surface works is you as a U and B domain. So it's sort of like we were just talking about in our X and Y grid domain, right? So we have uh, 40 in the X and Y. Um, a surface has something different. It's called a U and B, but it works a, a similar way. So um, any surface, regardless, can be re-parameterized into a domain of zero to one. So regardless of how big it is in the X and Y or in its U and B parameters, you can re-parameterize that surface so that the U and B always go between zero and one. And then if you have a grid that's always going to any type of grid that's going between zero and one, then you can map those same points uh, and recreate your grid on any type of surface. Does that make sense? Um, you're basically trying to translate from a world space to a surface space, um, a parameter space. And so the, you have to kind of convert uh, the uh, translation between the two, but um, it's certainly possible. And there's, as I said, um, there's a number of really good resources. These are, this is just an introduction webinar, and so I couldn't, of course, cover a lot of the different things, but um, there are a lot of good resources out there, especially on the forum, that I would recommend if, there, if you have specific questions like that. Okay, cool. And let's get to one more here. Um, and we blend two images into Grasshopper with this feature. Um, yeah, you could. Um, and I've, I have a kind of a fun example of that where you have two faces um, and you make a height field, um, and then you basically you can do it any number of ways. Essentially, you could then average the two values, right, um, or weight the two values. If we have a list of values, um, sorry, from this image sampler, and let's say we copy and paste this. Um, and copy and paste this. Um, you know, we would have if these were two different sets of values. You could then average between them, um, or bias the average, and then you could actually get uh, a weighted uh, uh, weighted morph between those two images. Um, another way to do that is to basically the way I was uh, doing it in another example was let's say I had two faces, um, and instead of doing this loft example, I just took this image and move my point grid up in the z-axis based on the x and y values. So that's how you make a height field um, of points. Uh, so I made a height field from one image and then I made a height field from another and I just moved the, the, the top grid up. Um, even though I moved it by its color value, I also added you know, 10 units so that it would be slightly above the, the other grid. Um, and then I created a, a series of lines between the points at the top and bottom. And then, and then with a simple slider, you can evaluate along each to those lines. So you can kind of push the points uh, that are evaluated along those lines towards one side or the other, and you can morph between one face and the other face, if that makes sense. Um, but yeah, it's not hard at all to do uh, if that's something you're interested in. It's just a matter of working with the data that you're given. Okay, cool. So um, fortunately, that's all the time we have for questions. But um, here, let me switch the screen back to mine. Okay, cool. And I will, uh, sorry, one last thing. I'll sh make sure I uh, document these uh, source files and um, I'll give them to you, Vince, so that you can share them on your site uh, if people want to go through those same tutorials in a little bit slower detail. Yeah, cool. That'd be great, actually. Some people were asking about that. So, again, I just want to thank you, Andy, for doing this. And I want to thank everyone out there for attending this presentation in Noveg's Best of the Best webinar series. Um, just a little background on NoVeg for anyone who's unfamiliar with us. We're the leading online design software superstore. Not only do we have the best prices around, but our staff is incredibly knowledgeable, and you can call and chat with us at any time. A um, little bit more information I'd like to draw your attention to. Here at NoVeg, we continue to go above and beyond for the design community. We've created several communities to foster collaboration and communication between design professionals. One such, Rhino Jungle as shown on your screen, will be great for uh, all Grasshopper users. We have a Grasshopper users group that you can come and join. Um, it's free. It's easy to sign up. When you do join, you get instant access to the latest information, trends, news, videos, tutorials. This webinar we made available on there for free, so anyone can go back and view it there later. Um, again, there's like tons of forums, so if you had any questions that weren't answered, this would be a great way to like get them answered. So I mean, yeah, if you have any other questions, don't hesitate to email me. My email is right there, vince at noveg.com. Any questions or comments you had about the webinar, I would love to hear them.
Um, you can go to our website, noveg.com slash webinar series to view any upcoming webinars we have. Um, two weeks from today, we'll be have hosting 3D pattern mo modeling with Paracloud Modeler, if any of you are interested in that. And then, um, so having said that, Andy, is there anything else you want to say? Uh, no, I just thank you again for the invitation. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for doing this. And uh, to everyone out there, we'll see you next time.